The first trade union in Australia was formed in 1850. Whilst the first film evidence of unions was not until 1926, unions themselves did not engage in film production until the 1950s. When the union controlling labour on Australia's waterfronts was the only union in the world to fund a film unit. In five years they made 19 films on subjects that the government film unit, commercial filmmakers or newsreel producers would never tackle, like housing shortages, industry from the unionist viewpoint and issues concerning workers' rights. Just recently, despite much lower union numbers and a vastly changed industrial, economic, political and cultural landscape, the same union has revived this film unit. In this presentation, I take a historical overview of trade union filmmaking in Australia, focusing on the output of these two film units from the Wharfies. Why, after a period of nearly 50 years, was the film unit revived? What does it mean for Australian films about labour? And what does a comparison of the two film units' outputs tell us about the relationships between media and citizenship? In most Australian visual sources from the 1950s, we were frequently invited to recall the era from a conservative viewpoint. Successful post-war reconstruction, scenes of plenty, large-scale immigration, the revitalisation of industry, huge projects like the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme and political peace and quiet are most often represented. However, the 1950s is also remembered by many as a period of intense activity and conflict, with incidents such as the Petrov Affair, the Labour Party split and the activities of the trade union and peace movements. Images of struggle, protest or opposition to the values of the Liberal government are scarce. If there are representations of troubles or dissenting voices, they are presented from a conservative attitude. The positive significance of the left is diminished. Life after World War II in Australia was not all consumer culture and suburban bliss. But our visual recollections seldom reconstruct the period in this way. These histories are not often told in the mainstream media. The imagery of 1950s society as a bounded, cohesive unit most often evoked in Australian main mainstream rhetoric and practice was Australia as the island continent. For Australian anti-communists, the margins of Australia were the shores of the continent and the exits and entrances, those perennial trouble spots, the ports, docks and wharfs of the waterfront. Communists and immigrants were very often in the post-war period lumped together as the baddies of Australian society. Dockside facilities and workers, though visible to all, have been an interesting case of media mainstream representation and transgressive representation. In the island nation of Australia, for its whole history from the European invasion of 1788, shipping was a key national industry and as the conditions of post-war reconstruction placed an increasing emphasis on the worker and the apparatus of production, so waterside disputes became a national issue. In the Cold War climate of the early 50s, the mainstream media cooperated with the government in mounting a fierce and long-lasting campaign of anti-communism. One of the frequent targets of these attacks was the Waterside Workers' Federation, a particularly militant union with a strong leadership in Jim Healy, who was a member of the Communist Party of Australia. Back then, the union had over 24,000 members. The establishment of a film unit within the Sydney branch was made possible through the industrial strength and the large membership of the Federation, and the opinion of its leaders that film was a useful tool of propaganda. The impetus for the use of film in the Federation began through the popularity of cultural activities in an extension of rights for the workers. This was the first instance of Australian trade union film production. There were three members of the film unit. Jock Levy and Keith Gow were both part-time Wharfies who also worked in the Sydney theatre world and had previous filmmaking experience. Norma Disher was an active theatre worker who also had employment in another trade union. They made a promotional trailer for a Maritime Industries theatre production of a play by Ewan McColl called The Travellers. After the success of both the trailer and the play, they were asked if they could make a short piece about the Federation's current campaign, which was to achieve pensions for waterside veterans. After the film unit was given the blessing of the Federation executives and set up, the three filmmakers went on the union's payroll. The three of them worked collaboratively, without taking any clearly defined roles. 
Sometimes other filmmakers from within the membership of the Communist Party and the left in Sydney collaborated on their films, and members of the new theatre would contribute to their acting or other skills. Jock Levy had said that the CPA gave the impetus and the discipline that made it possible for us to work so effectively as a unit. In 1953, they made Pensions for Veterans as the founding film of the unit. It was made to support the union's campaign to get pensions for older wharfies. It hadn't been done before. Keith said that they had a much wider objective, which was to get a better deal for the workers overall. He said a radical social change was needed, and this was their part in the fight for that change. This film worked to counter the mainstream media's very poor image of waterside workers at the Sydney docks. They documented the lives of working class people and their families and their communities. One film, The Hungry Miles, made in 1955, is the most impressive of the unit's surviving work and chronicles the history of the Sydney waterfront. Jock Levy spoke about Jim Healy's decision to commission the film. We were workers on a job, he said. We could see things that should be common knowledge to every member of the Federation. This should be common knowledge to everyone outside the Federation as well to get some understanding of what was going on. Jock continued, So I think the advantage was because we were working down on the waterfront, not some outside group, not something initiated from up top from an executive's point of view, from, but from our experiences from underneath. It's interesting to see how the body of the worker has been represented in this film. Close-ups of bodies and faces are to be found throughout the film, which are generally absent or minimal in other Australian films at the time. Facial and bodily expressions are very important here in the construction of the character of the waterside workers. Fear, dejection, hunger, determination and anger are depicted. The work is not very mechanised. It is purely physical in most senses. The worker's body is the tool of the trade and very little else. And in this film, we see their intense efforts to drag the load or shovel the cargo. Many of the men filmed had lived through the strikes, disputes, working conditions and the depression days that are recreated in the film's second section. Their bodies are the sites of those political struggles, testaments to those experiences as we see in the close-ups. These are scenes which present the body as bearing witness to the Wharfie's history, a version of their history obviously constructed to meet specific needs.